please request everyone to take their seats and uh, get settled. Does this belong to anyone? It's a flash drive that was left up here. It's very nice. I'll take it. It's got world secrets in there. It's <laughs> the stock prices. Actually, the new intellectual property treaty is on that flash drive. <laughs> all right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for all being here. Uh, th this is our fourth panel uh, that will co cover the topic of Internet domain name governance. Uh, we have three distinguished panelists here that I'm very happy to introduce. Uh, our first is Christine Hyde Farley, who is a professor of law and the associate dean for faculty and academic affairs at American University Washington College of Law. Uh, Professor Farley teaches courses in intellectual property, trademark law, international and comparative trademark law, and law in the visual arts. Uh, she serves as co-director of the program on information, justice, and intellectual property. And her work is largely in the areas of intellectual property law, international law, and art law. Uh, though, as she liked to hold out, that her current projects are the study of it, the intersection of art and IP, and the unstable basis of rights in the development of trademark law. Uh, to her left is... Uh, He's Andres Gallo. Uh, he's associate professor uh, at the Coggin College of Business at the University of North Florida. I, I think Jackie played the little joke on me, as I like to do interdisciplinary work. Uh, this is really our only major interdisciplinary panel with a law professor, an economist, and a technologist. Uh, so we will hopefully have a very interesting uh, debate here. Uh, professor Gallo is associate professor uh, in the Department of Economics and Geography, and his research interests are property rights, law and economics, uh, political economy, economic development, institutional and international economics. Uh, to his left, uh, as we already have been quite uh, introduced to, and, and I have to say quite pleasantly introduced to a sense of humor, uh, Carl Albrecht, uh, Chief Technology Officer at Interworking Labs in Santa Cruz, California. Uh, Carl has been developing internet technology since the early 70s and is also engaged in the issues of law, technology, and internet governance. As we've heard already a couple of times here, he also has uh, the distinction of being one of the, the only, right, elected American North, American. Member, uh, North American elected uh, member of the board of directors of I can. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Well, thank you. Um, and thank you to uh, Case Western and to Jackie for inviting me. This has been a great day so far and a great evening last night. Um, I don't really have a paper, and uh, I think I'll be uh, fairly brief here. Um, I am not a person who has spent a lot of time um, thinking about internet governance or writing about internet governance. So I had a little bit of a shudder when I saw my name on this panel when I thought I was here to talk about trademark law. So I'm going to talk about trademark law. Um, <laughs> but um, I, um, it, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. And so I thought what I'd do is um, tell you about a couple of experiences I've had. So this is going to be a personal account. Um, um, which has caused me to think about internet governance some. And so I've called this ICANN's trademark law, hoping to provoke. Um, and, you know, reminding us that, you know, we hear this uh, in the early writing in the, 1990, in the 19, late 1990s about internet governance, lots of statements about, you know, um, sorting out roles. And there were policy roles and there were technical roles. and um, ICANN would have only a technical role, although we know that's a folly. Um, and instead, what we've seen through the UDRP and through a lot of what I'm going to talk about today, um, very clear policy decisions um, about uh, intellectual property in particular. Um, so my first foray into this uh, came about um, not with UDRP, although obviously we all were introduced to um, what could happen in trademark law through the domain name process there, I think. Um, I really became more involved in, the, um, in this uh, second WIPO internet domain name process. I don't know if you, uh, anybody was involved with this, um, but they produced this interim report in uh, April 2001, which I um, got really excited about because it was proposing all of these uh, ex extending UDRP in all of these areas, which all of which I thought were problematic. And just to take one for example, um, it is recommended that the scope of the UDRP be broadened to cover abusive registrations of geographical indications. Um, so to bring us back to the topic uh, 
because I wondered how the topic last night connected to domains, but here it is right here. Um, uh, so the, you know, WIPO was proposing to ICANN um, that uh, UDRP shouldn't focus only on trademarks, but it should focus on all other problematic uh, or abusive registrations, um, things that, that were rights or quasi-rights, and they included, for instance, geographical indications. In this proposal, they also included personal names, um, you know, pharmaceutical names, they had a, a long list of other things, um, and, and uh, country, uh, country names in addition to geographical indications. Um, so I, I um, gave comments to WIPO. Um, the main point that I made is that um, when we're thinking, when you're thinking about these new exclusions, um, be a little bit sensitive to whether there's any law there uh, that you're extending. You know, how solid is the law? Um, WIPO of anybody should know um, all of the issues and pitfalls and disagreements around geographical indications. How could we possibly extend those rights uh, to the internet? Uh, I made this, I put this, these comments in writing and I presented this to WIPO and uh, uh, Francis Gurry afterwards said, nicely done, I disagreed with everything that you said. Um, and I pointed out to him that one of the things that I said was um, I thought it was a good idea that they provided uh, this opportunity to comment and I think he disagreed with that as well. <laughs> um, but uh, let's not forget what WIPO's all about. WIPO's mission is to promote the protection of intellectual property throughout the world, to promote the protection, to extend the protection. So this is, a, this is a, an opportunity for WIPO, I think, and um, they have expertise that we don't expect ICANN to, ICANN, ICANN to have over uh, trademark law, but they uh, might be differently situated. So that was really WIPO through ICANN. Um, the next four I had involved uh, generic top-level domains, and uh, thank you, Paul, uh, for introducing a lot of the things um, because you understand it a lot better than I do, and I don't have to get into a lot of the, the stuff that's been happening. But just a little brief history here: um, we had um, top-level domains um, pre ICANN, and a couple of um, instances where ICANN has extended the um, top-level domains, and now we have a big proposal here. Um, after many, many years of trademark owners fighting the proposal to extend, uh, the, to open up the space to new top-level domains, um, and there was a um, policy recommendation that was introduced, the, the, the final version of the policy um, uh, written by the GNSO, um, was um, presented to ICANN at their meeting in Puerto Rico in June of 2007, and I went down there as a country trademark lawyer um, to say I thought there were some significant problems um, in the proposal involving trademark law. Um, but as the history progresses here, you see that nevertheless, ICANN board approved uh, the proposal, and um, we've been hearing since that time that in 2010, now we hear late 2010, um, we're going to see um, possibly thousands of new generic top-level domains. Um, Paul's presentation just um, really reinforced for me <laughs> that there's great time pressure and a ton of issues. There's just a ton of activity going on uh, around ICANN right now. Um, he talked about the IRT proposing a tapestry of proposals. Um, it's a little bit like smoke and mirrors, there's so many moving parts at once, it's hard to focus on all of it. It's but more like a rug. It's a rug yeah. that can <laughs> be pulled out. Uh, so, um, so there's a lot going on and a lot of time pressure. So um, these were three of the recommendations that the GSNO made um, that um, I'm highlighting for you. Um, in terms of top, new generic top-level domains, they should not be confusingly similar, so we have that same language, to an existing top-level domain or a reserve name. Strings must not infringe the existing legal rights of others that are recognized or enforceable under generally acceptable and internationally recognized principles of law. Sounds solid. Yeah. And third, strings must not be contrary to generally accepted legal norms relating to morality and public order that are recognized under international principles of law. Solid ground we're on with these proposals, right? So I gave some comments, and um, 
Uh, Il Young was uh, very careful to say twice that he would not ever put his picture on a PowerPoint slide, um, but he has referred to me as a movie star, so I had to put my picture. <laughs> In fact, the only good thing to come out of my trip to the ICANN meeting was that I got this caricature of me made, so I wanted to include it there. Uh, so I, I, um, ma I tried to make this point, and it was kind of, I was, I was trying to be, um, uh, you know, have a warning sound of internet governance um, that um, there are really big problems in assuming that trademark law is so, uh, is so tight and so simply transferred um, from the world of uh, trademarks to the world of domain names. Um, there look like, it looks like there are some good key phrases and some good concepts that we can borrow, but they're much more problematic. And so I worry that in adopting these half concepts from trademark law, because it's not always an accurate incorporation, um, that we're not only going to create um, uh, havoc in the domain name space, but also there will be a spillover effect in terms of trademark law and how that law develops. And that's why I call this ICANN's trademark law. Um, and that it's very clear, these are very clear policy choices being made by ICANN um, that they should be afraid uh, to make, that they should, you know, they should be very cautious in going down this, this route in, into internet governance. That's what I said. I thought that was scare ta tactics, um, but so I had some real substance as well. And the first point is the use of the phrase confusingly similar, which we saw in the UDRP, and that um, we saw again in the second domain name process, and we saw again here in these, uh, pr this proposal and recommendation for dealing with new um, generic top-level domains. What does it mean, confusingly similar? Um, there's language in the explanation of the recommendation which seems to indicate that um, the uh, GNSO conflates that with confusion, right? So how the law deals with confusion, the law should deal with things that are confusingly similar. But of course, we're only looking at, at most, visual, phonetic, and conceptual similarity. We don't have context um, to compare. Um, we don't have use to compare in most cases, and we have very different understandings in different territories. So that creates a lot of problems, and that's one of the key, uh, th those are the key differences um, between trademark law in the world of trademarks and trademark law in the world of domain names. That is, it's unhinged from any territory or any territorial understanding, and it's taken out of context so that we can't really um, deal with the concept of confusion. So for instance, um, uh, there probably is a domain name and a trademark owner, Navajo, um, and, what a, and so they would then be able to prevent someone from registering a new generic top-level domain, um, dot .navajo. And perhaps it would be the Navajo Indians who would want to register a top-level domain, Navajo, and these rules seem to indicate that somebody who has an existing um, second uh, uh, level domain or a trademark would be in a position to prevent the Navajos from reg registering such a name under this concept of confusing similarity. This wouldn't be the result under confusion in trademark law, but it would be the result here. The other thing is um, there was mention of protection of famous names. Um, and that I, I would t just offer to you as one example of you know, kind of a sloppy incorporation of, of trademark law because there's no concept of famous names in trademark law. There are famous marks, that's a legal concept only in US law. There's well-known marks, which is a concept in international law. This is neither, maybe it's supposed to be both, I'm not sure what it is, um, but it could lead uh, to a lot of difficulties. Geographical indications was also mentioned in terms of pre-existing rights, um, and that's the same uh, mess that it's always been. And then, of course, the, the thing that got a lot of attention was um, the prohibition against immoral names as top-level domains. Um, and where does that come? There's lots of citation to different international treaties that, protects, that protect um, uh, morality standards um, to suggest this is just an extension of international law. It should be uncontroversial. International bodies have already accepted these notions. Um, and and it, in, in fact, it does exist in um, international trademark law. In the Paris Convention, um, Article 6, Kin Keys, um, the Paris Convention permits states to adopt laws to prohibit immoral marks. It's a 
it's permission, it's allowed, it's not required that they do so. And of course, if they do so, two things. It would have to be determined that it would be immoral in that territory. And then that prohibition would only be a prohibition against the registration of a mark. It wouldn't be the prohibition against the use of that mark. Um, and so we have to think about what is a domain name uh, registration or what is a domain name uh, registry, a new top-level domain. Is it more akin to a trademark registration or is it more akin to use? I would suggest it's much more akin to use. Um, and so that raises some real uh, speech issues, that, let alone the question of, you know, whose morality and, you know, um, I'm sure that there would be some people in this country who would love to have a dot Jesus um, top-level domain and there would be people in other countries who would find that probably immoral and, you know, upset public order. So um, I utterly failed in convincing anyone that these were bad ideas and these are the recommendations um, now um, in, in terms of finding a way to roll out these new uh, generic top-level domains. Um, these are the four, um, uh, four concerns I have, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about which each of them are. I thought about um, um, putting emphasis added in, the, in this text, but then I, I, it, was all, um, it was all italicized because there was too many issues uh, in the language. So um, confusingly similar is, an, is, is, is still an issue. What, it, what is it exactly? Um, and an existing TLD um, now has a place of prominence, right? Just because there's an existing second level domain, um, that should preempt the, uh, the, uh, a new generic top level domain. And I don't see the logic of that. Um, I guess be, if, you're, if confusingly similar means there's a visual similarity, there's the word Amazon, there's the word Amazon, okay, but why, why should there be that problem? What, you know, Amazon.com can sell anything it wants, and maybe there's an application for a registry by the region of Amazon uh, to talk about things related to the Amazon. When we have use, that confusion will sort itself out. That is, there won't be any confusion. Um, but uh, otherwise, I don't see why it should be prohibited. These string confusion concerns are to be directed through a different um, it's proposed that they be directed through the International Center for Dispute Resolution. Legal rights objections, um, those disputes should be referred to WIPO. Um, that is the proposal. And again, here we're talking about a um, confusing similarity between existing legal rights and a top-level domain. And that is a little <laughs> bit broad. Um, for example, trademark holders, right? But just for example. Um, suggesting that there are, there's a litany of other existing legal rights which could prevent the uh, adoption of a new top-level domain. And I wonder what those are, and I wonder why we're, um, we're kind of uh, using domain name policy to figure out what are legal rights that the world all agrees uh, to. Okay, and then the morality and public order. Contrary to generally accepted legal norms of morality, I don't know what that is. Um, and I love it that there might be quick look cases, right? Some of these cases are going to be just so easy. Uh, we can figure them out with a quick look. Um, so, you know, we'll see about that. Um, and then a new category, community objections. There's a substantial, op if there is a substantial opposition, opposition to the GTLD application from a significant portion of the community to which the GTLD string may be explicitly or implicitly targeted. I guess this is my Navajo example, right? Um, it could be dot Navajo. Objectors can be an established institution associated with a clearly delineated community, but they don't need to be. Um, so that's wide open as well, and I, and I don't really know um, if it's an importation of trademark law where this comes from. There is no, there's no corollary. Um, so some of these problematic things which are, you know, more or less on the table now being hammered out that uh, Paul talked about, the trademark clearinghouse, um, uh, again, it gives a pride of place to trademarks that hadn't existed before. The idea that these trademarks are so, trademark rights are so stable, and especially stable across territories, um, exist in this kind of property and gross state that trademark law has never recognized, then this might make good policy, but I don't know that to be how trademark law exists. 
Um, the most controversial, as Paul mentioned, was the globally protected marks list. Um, these um, where, again, not famous marks, not well-known marks, um, the, the language that they used was highly recognized names. Um, again, a category that doesn't exist in the law, how would we know what, would, what to be put there, and who's going to make this determination? Um, WIPO hasn't been able to do that for well-known marks under 100 years of treaty law. Um, and Paul also mentioned the uniform rapid suspension. Um, just to highlight one little thing to make my point about where is this law coming from and who's making it, um, there, uh, Paul already mentioned it's to be a fast system, it's to be, I think you said, the kind of summary judgment type of case. One of the things they, one of the um, phrases that they use to indicate what a slam dunk case this would be is it would only apply in cases where um, the, the opposer, the um, person bringing the complaint, um, had a registered trademark from a jurisdiction that has an examination, as if that's solid, as, right? I mean, we've never, we've never invalidated a registered trademark in this country, and you know, we have one of the most rigorous uh, examination um, processes. So uh, again, just um, a suggestion about trademarks that domain, the domain name community seems willing to accept, and the trademark community would never accept. Um, that these trademark rights are so static and so uh, solid. Um, so it's all very troubling to me, and I can hardly keep up with this. Um, and um, after hearing um, about Paul's conference calls, I'm just uh, concerned that uh, I think we all need to be uh, more involved in providing public comments uh, and getting some uh, critique out there that ICANN is really taking us down a road that um, you know, WIPO would have loved to take us down and hasn't been able to. Uh, so it's, it's quite shocking. Thank you for your attention. Well, um, hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me tell you, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, this uh, today has been a very good day for me. I've learned a lot about law. Um, so it's like an intense crash course on a little of everything. And um, so now, being an economist, I'm going to do what Dan asked me to do last night, which is show you like four or five differential equations uh, to see how the world is going to work based on those differential equations. And that's what we're going to do. Uh, my, now, my presentation is going to be a little more, uh, uh, we'll touch on economics and hopefully a little in, in law. Uh, but my knowledge in, in law is not as deep as you would expect. So I will ask you to please bear with me. Um, I would like to thank my co-author, Jay Kaysen. He couldn't be here. And um, we always write together and have a nice combination of styles and ideas. Uh, this presentation is, um, is about the main names, but we tried to take uh, a little different approach. Uh, usually, most of the studies I would say talk, of course, about ICANN's UDRP, and we start discussing how good it is, how bad it is, how efficient is delivering the goods that they're supposed to deliver. And, and I mean, there are thousands of things written about it. And um, of course, there are problems, very well known also, but you know, it's maybe not the best thing out there, but it's what we have. So to do, resolve domain disputes in GTLDs, that's where you go. Now, what we would like to take a look at is, okay, we have been discussing this for a long time, but what else is out there? So we start looking at countries. We start looking at countries and, and CCTLDs and see what we want to look at is how a country decides or why they're going to decide to use some kind of system in order to solve their domain name issues that maybe are not the same dom domain name issues that we have in the US. And one thing that is it's always very, uh, uh, very interesting to me is that every time you talk about issues, legal issues about trademarks or about protection of property rights uh, re regarding the, the domain names, 
uh, we're always trying to look at those from the perspective of U.S. legal environment and legal culture. While well, the world is more than the U.S., uh, maybe there are other perspe perspectives out there. And, and the issue is, okay, why does perspective exist? And what can they inform to us or what they can be telling to us? And this is where economics come into place. Usually when we talk uh, in economics about, um, about legal framework, any kind of legal framework or regulation, we don't talk necessarily to look at what is the best objective law that we can put in place on the land that will uh, secure some kind of rights or some kind of property or some kind of uh, a general idea of what we think is the best law. But we also talk about how a, a legal framework or a regulation can foster economic development. There's a very strong literature that talks about that. So for a country like the US, when you look at, for example, WIPO, and you look at domain names, we're always looking at all right, how they decide the cases. What is the impact that they have on our pre-existing uh, law cases regarding to trademarks? And we compare to that. While if you are in Ecuador, when in the last 10 years, from 1996 to 2006, Ecuador has, has 10 presidents and six different constitutions, your questions regarding domain names are very different, completely different. And there's nothing there. So the question for Ecuador is, all right, I'm, I'm going to have a system in which most of the people investing on, for example, internet technology or online businesses are not going to be locals. Are going to be foreigners. Now, how foreigners are going to be able to navigate this chaotic legal system? So, how can I use a domain name legal framework in order to foster the development of that sector? So, it's a different kind of question. It's more economically, it's more basic question than the questions that we have regarding the system because there are many things that we take for granted. So it's, uh, and that is where we are trying to go with this. Um, so the two main research questions, and, and I'm not going to show huge results here because this is a work in progress. Uh, this is an ongoing, an ongoing research project, and, and believe me, I would love to have your feedback on this. Is first, uh, we would like to look at Dispute, dispute resolution systems characteristics around the world. And I think that, for example, Paul's uh, book would be a great source to look at all the different CCTLD dispute res resolution process that are out there. And it will be a very good characterization that will help to this, to this, um, to this uh, project. But then the second question that is very important is, all right, we want to look at those system in the context of the economy. That is, why a country will choose a system in terms of another system, or how a country can use that as an instrument to help to develop economically. That's, that's, that's the idea that we have behind it. So it's, it's this interrelation between economics and law that we're trying to look at. Now. Uh, right now, we, we have selected about, we have a sample of about 40 countries, we just picked them randomly. And um, what we did is we went and looked at what were this, uh, their dispute resolutions for their domain names on their country codes. And basically, what we did is we not just went to the website, but we also tried to contact people, somebody that will explain that, us, how their system will work. We will have a complaint, you know, on their registry. We have a domain name, for example, in um, Malaysia. Somebody will tell us, okay, this is what you should do if you have a complaint, and this is how this complaint will be solved. I will gather, gather information about this, this, uh, these regimes. Now, this is the list of the 40 countries that we have uh, all over the place, uh, developed countries, developing countries. Uh, we plan to expand this sample. This is not definitive. Uh, now. What we found out is that, broadly, you can divide 
the, 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 the regulatory system in three main categories. First, you have countries that will tell you, okay, if you have a problem, you go to a court. That's it. That's, there's nothing. We don't provide anything except for going, for example, if you are in Argentina, right, and you have a complaint, okay, go, go to a court. There will be a local or federal court that you can go and solve the dispute. Um, another bunch of countries say, no, we have our own system. And, and when you look at those systems, you would call them private systems, but in, in reality they are usually non-profits, or some, some of them are related to the state, but have some independence from the state. And they are, uh, in part, are very similar in their procedure to what I can, that you, the European I can provide. And then you have countries that they will tell you, no, all right, we provide you something, but we cannot build our own system, so we use ICANN. Usually they use WIPO or directly ICANN, go to the UDRP, and they will handle our ca cases. So that's what they do. They just ship their cases to ICANN. So those are the three main systems that we found out out there. Now, when you look at the, the, the countries that use uh, the courts, the, the local courts, usually what will happen is that uh, there is not much information. It's like there's no much information on the website. I mean, the website usually don't say anything. But if you try to contact somebody, uh, the most common answer, I'm not telling this every country, but the most common answer is go to the courts. We have the legal system. That's it. There's no information about, all right, which, I mean, it's a local court, it's a federal court, how this will work. I mean, it's, it's just a black box. It's legal system. And, and there's nothing else uh, there. There's no information. And in some cases, they never answer back. And you, you learn from secondary uh, sources what the system is in place, but, the, but the, the, the administrators, the managers of the registry, registry do not go back to you. You can call them on the phone. You can send them emails. They don't, it looks like they don't exist. When you ask and try to consult on the, this kind of cases. So it's a I mean, very distant system, very, very user-friendly. It's not user-friendly at all. Now, when you, um, when you look at uh, the private, the countries that have their own private system, usually are countries that either are rich countries or they have a very good developed IT sector, like, for example, India. So those countries, they have their own system, and, and uh, if you look at the system, they're very close. To, we're going to talk a little more about those. Uh, but here, there's more feedback. There's more information. Either you go online and you have everything there. I'm going to show you in a moment Malaysia case. Or you send them an email or you try to contact them, and they're right back to you. They're very, very easy to contact, very rich information on those places. So you feel like there is a structure that, that, will, that, that, that support their system. It's very, very different. And finally, you have countries that use ICANN's UDRP. Now, what we, have not, what we want to identify here uh, that is very important is if they're using ICANN because of choice or they're using ICANN because of some kind of uh, economic agreement, you know, maybe if you sign a free trade agreement or you get a loan from the World Bank to develop your uh, IT infrastructure, that's great, but you need to use ICANN. I mean, we are trying to research into why they are using ICANN, which is, I think, it's a very important question, because one thing is if you do it as an own decision, another thing is that somebody's pushing you to do it. Uh, in that case, there is information, but usually the information points you at the UDRP website. So they say, okay, we have nothing to do with this, all the information is there, but we rely on them. Okay? The, the only difference is that if, uh, if you go through the ICANN process, usually if you opt to go to a court, you have to go to a court in the country. So that's, that's the only uh, main difference we find. Now, then what we have to look is, okay, why a country would pick, you have rich countries, you have middle income countries here, uh, we we'll try to look at why a country uh, will, 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 pick, uh, will pick a system. 
And one of the things that's very important, especially for developing countries, I told you before, is that uh, when you talk about internet and when you talk about investment in IT technology, usually you need to rely on foreign investors. Uh, like I told you before, if you are Ecuador, it's not like you have a very strong IT sector that will fuel your domestic investment. Usually what you will do is you rely on foreign investors to provide the needed infrastructure, the backbone of your IT sector. So in that sense, how are you going to convince those investors to go to your country? So here we have this idea that, okay, in that case, you can try to do signaling, just send a sign to investors and say, okay, we are user friendly. We will provide you with the system that you know. So if you have a legal problem, instead of having to, to deal with a new constitution next month, you can deal with a system that you're used to. And that's where this selection of ICANN can come out as a signaling process. Now, the question will be, why ICANN? Why I don't go and select the process in Canada? You know, and say, hey, the Canadians will handle my cases. Why WIPO? I mean, that, that's, that's a different question, but it's, it's, it's an open question. Um, now, the ones who use the court, and because of the lack of information, it's like, they, okay, it's up to you. Just if you want to come, come and learn how our legal system works. If you don't want to come, I don't know. There's, we're not offering anything special uh, uh, to, to your company. Um, now, the, the procedures, I told you before, this example, for, this is what you will find in Malaysia. If you go to Malaysia, they have a private resolution, uh, dispute resolution process, and this is what you find. Very descriptive uh, information, and this, is, this, 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 this graph, this figure comes together with pages and pages that explain you very clearly what you have to do, what are the different steps on the process that you will go through, how the um, panelists are selected, how much time you have to respond, so on and so forth. It's a very, very well-designed system. Now, if you look at, when you start looking at this, and you compare this, for example, with UDRP, they're very similar. But they're very, very similar, but they are creating their own structure. And, and the information is very rich. So if you, it's, it's, it's prepared in such a way that if you decide, okay, I'm gonna have a, a domain name in this country, you absolutely know from day one what's gonna happen if you have a complaint on that domain name. So it's very transparent, a lot, a lot of information. Um, these countries also have, happens to have their, their procedures uh, usually online. So you can submit online your complaints or, or your, your responses. Um, the countries who use the UDRP, of course, you use the usual UDRP process, and the countries who have the courts uh, don't provide much, much information online. You have to go through the, just, I don't know, hire a lawyer and go to the, to the courts in that, that country. Uh, when you look at the selection of panelists, again, it's very similar to the UDRP. Um, they, they usually explain, the, the, the countries that offer a private system they usually explain you very clearly how those panelists are selected. And they give, in some cases, you have a list of panelists that you can, you can review online. Um, now, some of these um, countries also provide cases, like the ones we were talking with Paul, uh, he, he documented in his book. You have, you have cases that you can, go, databases that you can go and look at the cases and see how those cases have been resolved. So again, we go back to this uh, idea of transparency and, and to provide this information. Um, in, 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 in countries with, with a core system, with a regular core system, there is no idea of how previous cases have been solved, what the courts have decided or, or anything. It's very, very scant information. Now, the interesting thing is that it doesn't matter who is in charge of the registry. You could, you could have a government agency or a non-profit managing the re registry, and you could have either a court system or a private system. So there is no clear correlation uh, that a 
a non-profit organization in charge of the registry is going to be more willing to have a, a private dispute resolution process than a government agency. So there is no clear indication of, of differences. Uh, when you look at the speed, and, and this is the, the speed of process, this is the, not the actual speed, but the speed that they listed on their on their on the pages. The average is about 50, 51 days, but the, the median is about 60 days. So that usually two months is what they expect to the, to, to have the, the the case solved. And the cost, of course, varies by country. We are we are trying to get the database with all the different costs on, on those countries. Now. The next step, and what we are trying, this is what we are working now, is we got a, a, a database with economic indicators. And what we try to do is to look at those economic indicators and try to see if your performance, specifically your performance on the IT sector, is correlated or not, or has something to do with the kind of legal system that you choose for your domain names. Is anything there or not? Now, first, this table is showing you, you have different, these are general economic indicators, nothing special. But here you have the average for countries who pick the core system, countries who pick a private system, and countries who pick ICANN to deliver the dispute resolution process. What you see there is that the main difference in general indicators is income. The income per capita, GDP per capita. Countries who have a private system are much higher income per capita. Why? Be, well, they're rich countries. They have the resources to put together a, a private dispute resolution process that will handle their cases. So it's not, not strange to find that. When you look into who picks ICANN, you see that income slows down. And you have a bunch of countries that pick ICANN, they're actually very low income. So this average is a little, it's not a very good measure because you have a few countries above and few countries very, very low. But then, in general, the countries who pick cores are countries with much lower GDP per capita. Now, if we start looking at the at IT indicators, for example, um, expenditures as percentage of GDP or internet user per 100 people, uh, here you see uh, most of these indicators, the countries who use the cores seems to be on the low end countries who use ICANN in the middle range, and countries who have their own private system in the high range. And this is consistent. This is when, when we look, I mean, there are more indicators there. And, and it put on not only, uh, even there are some indicators like cost, how much it costs uh, broadband internet tariff in dollars per month. And you see a different, very, very big difference in cost, how much it costs there. So. And, 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 and this, what this is, is showing us, okay, there is something there. Okay, we can, I mean, the, our legal system, our regulatory system, is not necessarily just, you know, an ideal that we define and we go on and put there, but has real consequences. And it could have real consequences for countries, right, that are trying to develop their IT sectors. They're trying to develop their, 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 their internet infrastructure. Because, like I told you before, those countries usually rely on foreign investors. Take a look at this indicator, which is very important for me. When you look at um, high technology exports as per percentage of manufactured exports, you see that both the countries that have cores and the countries that have ICANN have very low exports of high technology goods. While countries who have a private sector, they have a much higher component. What that means is that means how competitive is your technology sector in the rest of the world. So very low ratios of that indicates that you actually depend on the rest of the world for, for your technology and for your development. So this is what we are working now. What we are trying to do is to use this, that we have a huge database on, on, on indicators. So what we are trying to do is trying to correlate this and, and see if when they adopted this legal system, there was a change after compared to before in order to make sure that these correlations are the correlations that we expect them to be. But then, I mean, when you look at this data, when you correlate these legal choices with this information, you go again to this economic development uh, issue that has been very well researched in economic literature and that goes to the root of 
how the legal system can have a real impact, not only in how you decide the case, but also on businesses, on the economy. So when, when this work is really helpful uh, in, in all the other conversations that we have today is because then all these issues that we are debating here, you can see that they have a real importance on the, on the real world. I mean, you can say, oh yes, of course they have. Right? But somebody will tell you, okay, go out and prove it. And, and that's basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to show, okay, there is something there. The discussion that we're having here today has a real importance in the world. Because in the end, it will affect resource allocation and it will affect economic performance. And this is what we are trying to get into uh, by looking at that. Um, so just to conclude, and, and these are preliminary conclusions, of course, we know that ICANN has been a very strong, uh, has, has a very strong influence on countries. Because what you see is that on these three regimes, even the, the countries who develop their own private dispute resolution process, they're looking at UDRP. I mean, it's like they're using that as their main focus and adapting to their realities. So it's not that like they're coming out with something different. But if it will be, what is good is to look at how they solve the problems that we have. I mean, there is something there to be learned. I, I enjoy very much this morning the, um, the discussion about Canada and how they establish their d dispute resolution process and how they, they handle the issues that they're similar to the issues that we have. Of course, like I told you before, Ecuador is not the same than Canada, but there are things to be learned. Now, selecting the kind of regulatory system that you have for the internet can be not necessarily, like I told you before, just a choice of legal regime, but it could be a signaling process. It could be a way to have a real impact, a real economic impact on the development of the sector. Um, for, some, for some countries, ICANN can be a cheap solution. Now, the, we will go back to your question here. It's okay, okay, most of the countries are choosing ICANN. Why they choose ICANN? Why they don't choose uh, the Canada system? Or why they don't choose, I mean, some other country system. Why don't they don't choose Malaysia? I mean, it's great. You go to a website, and it's, it's very easy to navigate. Why they don't choose that? So, uh, and, and that's what we got into this idea that, okay, uh, there is what we call in economics path dependence. I mean, ICANN and the UDRP was the first thing to appear. So it looks like that is the center where everybody should converge. But in the end, that is a, 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 a question that we should ask ourselves. Is that the case or we should go to a, a system that is more, di more diverse and that offers different countries around the world different options and different choices depending on their strategy for, for UDRP. Um, and, and, and I think that that's what we need to bring when discussing this, this, um, this governance issues, governance issues uh, about the dom domain name dispute resolution process and is that Different countries will adopt different systems because of different reasons, because of different needs. And, and we need to keep that diversity in mind. So with that said, thank you very much. This is, this is internet swag for .org. They're giving this stuff away now. Anyway, when I was putting together the, my thoughts for what to talk about today, I was thinking about, well, maybe we should start by talking about how the Treaty of Westphalia, which established the concept of the nation state, is now eroding and power is flowing into private hands, and that we really need to go back to the 17th and 18th or the 18th century thinkers about why we have constitutional governments these days. But I thought that was too trite, so instead I thought of putting to, uh, talking about What's going through the mind of Wiley e. Coyote, the Roadrunner char uh, cartoon character, just after he's run off the cliff and hasn't yet realized that gravity is about to take hold and plunge him down to the ground? So that's my topic here. Um, I've been around the internet for a very long time, since the beginning. And there's this one thing constant about the net, is it's always changing. Uh, let me put this closer to me. Uh, in my house a few months ago, we discovered a hidden plumbing problem. We discovered that the supporting structure underneath one of our bathrooms had been badly rotted and we'd have to replace the supporting timbers. 
Today, much of our discussion has been about the more refined aspects of trademarks and domain names. In this talk, I'm going to take you in a different direction, down into the basement, to take a look at the quality of the timbers that hold up trademarks, domain names, and internet governance. And I want to begin with the conflict between governance, authority, and technical reality. The fabled anarchy of the internet is rapidly becoming a thing of the past. And I'm sorry if I'm reading this, but I, I can only hear it one year, so my ability to speak and think at the same time is extremely limited right now. Anyway, bodies and rules of internet governance are quickly becoming a framework around which we structure our internet businesses and our internet lives. If that framework lacks a firm foundation, it could warp, be manipulated, or collapse. Such a collapse would, in turn, have a ripple effect on all of the relationships and rights that will be constructed on that framework. Framework. The effects of a crack in the foundation of internet governance could be significant, far-flung, and very painful. When it comes to governance of the internet, there are two foundation stones, authority and technical reality. Without authority, internet governance loses its power to command. Without authority, a body of internet governance becomes nothing more than a small stone that barely disturbs the river flowing around it. And without technical reality, a body of internet governance will find itself superseded and become irrelevant. We, as a community of lawyers and technologists, have been surprisingly willing to assume that authority exists or that technology will not someday be used ways and different than is the current norm. The point of this talk is we need to step back and examine our assumptions. It is my contention that we'll find the foundations of internet governance are lacking, weak, and in conflict with technical reality. I believe it is time to put it, to call a timeout on internet on our race or internet governance. We need to take a timeout to establish a firm foundation of legitimacy, authority, and technical relevance. Our focus here is domain names and online trademarks. That puts us squarely in the bailiwick of ICANN. A considerable portion of the rights that people that ha believe they have in domain names and trademarks associated with domain names derives from ICANN's provisions embedded in ICANN's contracts. Without ICANN, many of our perceived rights in domain names and trademarks could vanish. ICANN's foundation reminds me of a friend who lives in a New Hampshire house built in 1763. In the process of exploring a drainage problem, we discovered that the house had, built on, had been built on nothing more substantial than a few stones that had been piled up to support the wooden sills on which the house was framed. It cost a small fortune to jack the house up, insert a real foundation, and then cure the warpage that had accumulated over the years. I'm afraid that ICANN has put us in a similar position. ICANN has hit the double jackpot. ICANN lacks a source of authority, and ICANN is based on a technical fantasy. Unless these are cured, we may, end up, may have to jack up our existing rules of domain names and trademarks, build a new foundation, and deal with the accumulated warpage. To make matters worse, the method of control used by ICANN will amplify the extent of the damage should ICANN begin to wobble. ICANN sits at the vertex of a pyramid of contracts that guarantees that uncertainties about ICANN will quickly, quickly propagate. ICANN's lack of authority means that it may be vulnerable on the grounds that it is an unlawful combination or conspiracy and restraint of trade. We are here in Cleveland, home to J.D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company. J.D. Rockefeller justified his monopolistic practices on the grounds that it eliminated the effects of harmful competition or the harmful effects of competition. That sounds a lot like Inta's justification for not having new top-level domains. ICANN may eventually have to face the same questions that we faced in the 19th century with the Standard Oil Company. And ICANN may have to answer those questions not only in the United States, but also in non-US jurisdictions such, such as the European Union. ICANN's lack of technical reality means that ICANN will find itself high and dry should someone choose to establish a new domain name system route. These cracks in the stability and clarity of ICANN's role in internet governance will become wider and deeper as ICANN attempts to splatter itself onto multiple legal entities in multiple countries using specialized national legal structures, which in fact it is trying to do. So let's examine the foundations that underlie our existing ICANN-based regime of trademarks and domain names. Where is ICANN's source of authority? Many believe that ICANN's source of authority is like the seven cities of Cibola, illusory. Does, does ICANN's glamour of authority exist? I can't sp speak. Uh, does ICANN's glamour of authority exist only because internet users have, for the moment, chosen to avoid asking the hard question? ICANN began and remains merely a California corporation. ICANN has no special legal status. 
The authority that ICANN wields must come from some external source. Did ICANN's authority come from the United States government? ICANN's governmental companion, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, has never been able to articulate a clear statement of its own authority to act as a regulator of domain names, nor that if it had such power, that it has the power to delegate it to a private corporation. No less an authority than the U.S. Congress GAO has looked at ICANN twice and has come away without being able to find that either the Department of Commerce or NTIA has adequate authority. Not long ago, in September of this year, ICANN and NTIA signed an affirmation that purports to reduce the degree to which ICANN can be viewed as an instrumentality of the United States government. That agreement was notable for the absence of any statement that be can could be construed as a delegation of authority to ICANN. Alternatively, was ICANN's authority somehow derived from John Postel or the function that John filled, that of Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, IANA? If so, how did that task, a task performed via the University of Southern California, leap to ICANN? Assuming that John or IANA had the powers that ICANN now wields, an assumption that is not particularly solidly grounded, there is neither a trail of documents nor oral history to support an argument that a transfer did occur. Where else might we look for a source of ICANN's authority? NTIA did issue a zero-dollar purchase order under which ICANN performs the undefined IANA function. It's hard to reconcile a government purchase order, the same process used by the process that the government uses to purchase janitorial services as amounting to a delegation by the U.S. government of discretionary authority over a large part of the Internet. Did that purchase order delegate to ICANN a right to charge Internet users what accumulates to a large amount of money for the privilege of using certain parts of the net? Did that purchase order give ICANN the power to assign very lucrative parts of the net to third-party operators for time periods that are effect effectively perpetual? If ICANN's authority did somehow come from the U.S. government, then what happens to that delegation that ICANN and the U.S. government try to distance themselves from one another? These are not situations that create a sense of stability. Rather, it suggests that ICANN has been nailed together too quickly. We've all seen the Roadrunner cartoons. Is ICANN in a situation like that of Wile E. Coyote when he has run off a cliff and is standing in midair? We all know what comes next. He looks down, realizes the predicament, and crashes to the ground. It was once believed that the seas were too vast to be controlled. And it has been said that the internet must have exactly one domain name system. The idea that the seas were too vast was demolished in the later 1800s by Captain Alfred Mahan of the United States Navy. Is ICANN about to crash on the similar reef of technical reality? ICANN's control over DNS upon, depends upon the belief that the internet must have exactly one domain name system and that whoever controls the top level text file called the root zone controls that DNS. That belief is technically inaccurate. There already exist competing domain name systems. Most of them are very poorly run and have, been give, and have given a bad name to the concept. But good operators, needing only investment of a few hundred thousand dollars easily and without needing any permission, can establish competing routes. And despite the common wisdom and the self-preserving statements of ICANN, the existing, existence of competing routes no more destabilizes the internet or causes user confusion than the existence of competing mobile telephone companies. There are significant impulses that are inducing the creation of competing routes. The first is the profit motive. There are considerable opportunities to derive positive cash flow from a well-run competing route. Second is, the, is that competing routes provide a market-driven answer to the Gordian knot of new top-level domains. Third is that ICANN is perceived, even after the recent affirmation, as an instrument of United States hegemony over the net, thus suggesting to other nations the possibility of establishing their own routes as a kind of internet declaration of independence. Should competing routes arise, ICANN will lose its ability to dictate the terms of the domain name marketplace, including the UDRP, who is, and new top-level domains. In conclusion, there are several reasons to be concerned that the foundation underpinning ICANN in today's domain name world is brittle and could suffer catastrophic collapse through a successful lawsuit or the establishment of competing DNS routes. That doesn't mean that we should panic. The absence of a clear authority can be remedied through national legislation and international treaty. And 
Competing DNS routes can be viewed not as a threat, but as an opportunity to allow market-driven deployment of new top-level domains. In the longer term, however, today's domain name wars may become nothing more than sound and fury signifying nothing. All of this may become moot because technical innovation, particularly with the rise of better search and directory systems, is eroding domain names as indicators of sources of goods and services. In other words, the idea that domain names are, are trademarks may be an idea that has much place in the internet future as a dial-up modem. Thank you. First, I'd like to offer the panelists an opportunity to ask each other questions. I mean, all three topics are clearly related to one another and uh, raise some very interesting uh, points as they kind of intersect. So any questions from, from you all? Yep, Carl. Um, you, you raised the point of internet morality. I mean, when I was on the board of ICANN, I got a phone call one day from somebody who was seriously asking to establish dot Christian. And I said, <laughs> Have you thought really about this? Have you thought about the wars that have been fought over this? Uh, so your, some of your concerns are very real. And when you get to things like morality, uh, for example, some, in some locales, depictions of torture are considered immoral. Depictions of a man being nailed to a piece of wood and suspended in space to die might be considered as nearly pornographic, yet that is a symbol of Christianity. So we have a very dangerous situation if we start to engage in these things in, in the internet world. I mean, I, on the board of directors of ICANN, I was amazed how little I know, how insensitive I am to cultural differences. Uh, it was an amazing education. Mm. And uh, I don't think any organization that's as provincial, literally, as ICANN is, uh, should be making these kinds of decisions. Well, I think it's ironic that, I, and I don't know what the history is of adding this protection. Obviously, it's inserted there to get some community on board with the new um, top-level domains, but um, it's as if they hadn't thought through where they're putting themselves and what kind of decisions they're asking somebody. They always say it's not ICANN, but it will be some extension of ICANN's um, policy making that will make those decisions, and I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I mean, I tried to, you know, just play out a dozen hypotheticals of things that would be, you know, completely honorific in one country and scandalous in another, and you know, what kind of uh, battles would ensue. Yeah, when you mentioned also that it's mostly a trademark concern, um, it reminded me of there's a short story contest. Um, here's a short, real short story: for sale, baby shoes, never worn. That's 28 characters. It'll fit in as a domain name label. That's copyrightable, uh -huh, not just a uh -huh, trademark. Uh -huh. So we could have um, more than just trademark well, protection. Well, th so the, the trademark clearinghouse was originally titled IP clearinghouse because they were going to protect more than trademarks, and they've just scaled back ever so slightly to just deal with trademarks. We'll see. There's <laughs> still a debate. We didn't talk uh -huh. about the clearinghouse, but there's a debate about um, whether that should be trademarks registered trademarks, uh, trademarks that are examined both for absolute grounds and relative grounds, mm -hmm. which would take Europe out if, if not, mm -hmm. if, I mean, if that's the, you know, uh, but there's also the issue of um, indigenous rights mm -hmm. still being kicked around, the issue of uh, British corporate you know, company house names, which gives rise mm -hmm. to local rights, so there's still quite a bit of debate. All of the things that were in the WIPO's second domain process, basically, and then some. And, and they're already there. I mean, the, not, nothing in the language of the proposal, uh, dispute proposal, is limited to registered or even trademarks. So it's interesting that they would change that title of the clearinghouse when clearly they intend to move beyond s strictly trademarks. I'm just also wondering, who is protecting Twitter names? Hmm. <laughs> I just realized our company name was taken on Twitter just, just two days ago. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, I have a question for Carl. You were, uh, you were saying that a new domain name system is feasible, technically feasible. It and exists? Yes, but a good, a good run domain name system is technically feasible and doesn't cost much. Why do you think it hasn't happened yet? Well, first of all, the name has been given a, a terrible reputation. The people who run it, the most charitable description you can have are fruitcakes. Uh, 
they just don't know how to run a business. They know how to tick off people. They violate internet technical standards. They're nuts. But there have been a couple that have been run well, but they are by, put together by people who don't know how to make money. But you can, the DNS routes and DNS servers present a wonderful opportunity for data mining. You can find out at the beginning of a Super Bowl game by watching the query traffic which URLs that somebody's advertised during the first half are working and which are not so that an advertiser can change its strategy for the second half of the game. You could sell that for big bucks. But nobody's put that together by saying, well, I, want you, I need to drive traffic to my DNS route, so I will follow the Google money model and I will pay you to use my route yeah. while I'm selling the marketing results I'm getting from data mining your traffic to somebody out here. Yeah. They, they haven't come up with these ideas yet. And the way it, it solves the market, the uh, new TLD issue is, if you consider a route as like a supermarket of, of, of goods and of products, um, well, you go to a supermarket, you got Campbell's Soup, you got Kellogg's Corn Flakes, you got all these standard brands. Those are the .com, the .net, the .edu, the .ever. There's also a few boutique brands in those supermarkets. Somebody comes up with a new kind of grape jelly, goes in there, goes to the supermarket operator and says, hey, put this on your shelf. And the supermarket operator says, why? And so sometimes you have to, as a person who's trying to promote a new brand, building the brand, a standard process in marketing, you pay the vend the, the store to put, give you shelf space. After a while, you might build up some buyers, and another store may want to carry this. And it, organically, you either grow into more providers or you disappear. This works for cable TV channels on, on DirecTV and Comcast and whatever. It also works for kinds of soap in supermarkets. It's a standard way in which a brand, which is a TLD, grows or shrinks. The ICANN brand, um, store is just one store. If we did other stores out there, new people could come up with their new TLD idea, try it out, if their brand succeeds, if, if they pay all the root operators or all the root server operators to put it in theirs, it'll grow, it may shrink, it may disappear, but at least the market will be expressing uh, whether or not a new top-level domain should exist rather than a central organization. Well, I wanted to ask a follow-up question then, Carl. I mean, then what are the obstacles, right, to keep for the, that are keeping this from actually not only developing, other than perhaps that the initial entrance uh, may not be as savvy or as capable as... Mental inertia. Yeah. It's, it's really our, we're, we're prisoners of our own minds in, in some regard. Also, anyone who's doing this is going to have to endure the slings and arrows of the technical community because the... I, mean, I was mentioning during the break, Technical bodies, we, we invented the internet. We're proud of it. We don't want anybody touching it. We look upon all the new people out there as they, they're dirty, they're messing it up. Twitter is this horrible thing. We shouldn't be allowing it. They can't use the internet in ways we didn't conceive. And we're not new at this. The, the people who invented the telephone system, a wonderful system. We're so protective that in the Hushaphone case, I was saying, fought against a plastic hand to put on the handset said, this is going to cause operators to go deaf and linemen to be blown off the telephone poles. And they got the FCC to go along with this, yet it was totally false. Um, technical people become very protective of what they've built. And so we're going to find resistance from the technical community, um, whether it be accurate statements or, as we saw in the Hushifone cases, Hushifone case, complete fabrications. OK, questions? Yeah. Um, you, Talking about the creation of alternative routes, um, it, it, I would competing consider, routes. yeah, it, competing routes. It would be some of it a, of an extreme measure uh, for one to actually start taking over mul uh, more than just a small percentage of the internet. But why haven't we seen that competing top-level domain names? Why hasn't someone established an, a, a competing top-level? If, if I were I'm to sorry. establish a new .com, I would expect Verisign to come after me with a battle axe, a legal battle axe. Uh, okay, and if that's the case, then why why isn't like ICANN or organizations that are associated with ICANN coming after you for establishing a competing route? What interest do they have in it? What protectable legal interest do they have in it? Dot com is a, is it's got trademark protection, even though the USPTO may say it's not trademarkable. Hey, that's a name of a cognizable service. Um, they've got plenty of grounds and plenty of money to fight me. But for competing route, ICANN has already essentially waived the, the point by um, allowing competing routes to go along for so many years and has issued actually some papers that say, 
it's a bad idea, but it hasn't taken action to suppress those, those roots. And I would say, well, you didn't take action back there in 1999. What's different now? Haven't you waived your right? Um, real quick, I'm an information security professional as well before I came to law school. Uh, and one of the things that you mentioned, VeriSign, one of the things that they do is they provide certificate authority services, which if you go to something like AmericanExpress.com and you see the little green bar, that means that it's secure, you're at the right place. So these alternate routes, they can provide the same service, same domain name resolution services pointing to these um, sites and then it's up to the certificate authority to authenticate. Yeah, the, compete, the thing about competing routes is they better be consistent because yeah, you yeah. don't want to surprise people. But SSL certificates is a completely divorced from the domain name system except that you need this string in it. That yeah, well, my, my question was with regards to that, what kind of, what kind of, um, what kind of rules do they have in place right now to say that, that American Express really is American Express and is the owner of that? It's a pretty well-run operation in that regard. They, they have various levels. You can go to the lowest level where you basically just say, I have a domain name, and they just say, okay, and they give you your lo the lowest level certificate. But if you go through higher level grades of certificate from them, you have to go through greater and greater levels of proof that you are who you are. It costs more money, too. More about what kind of rules do they have in place to, to, to verify that, that you own that trademark? Like, if, if I tried to register American Express, obviously they wouldn't let me. Um, they're mostly trying to verify that you are who you are, not that you own a trademark. They aren't tied to a trademark. Okay. Right, so I want to I go away from the roots. I want to talk about, I think, to Christine and maybe to Andreas. So I, I, there was an interesting interface between what you were talking about and the discussion at lunch about the kind of informal growth of a jurisprudence out of a large set of supposedly non-presidential opinions, right? And so some of the objections, particularly that Christine raised, but both were that there's a lot of sort of questions that would have to be answered, but in some ways there are the same sorts of questions that trademark law and trade, you know, infringement law, dilution law always confronts. What's confusion? What's fame? What's a scandalous mark? You know, I mean, they're big questions. You spend a lot of time in class with your students talking about them, but they're not unanswerable questions at the national level. So what is it that makes it more troubling at the international level to take some of those same questions and then just recognize that they're inevitably going to be there at the international level as well? OK, it's a great question. So I guess um, the, the small, easy answer is that um, because they're good, hard questions, they're better answered within a jurisdiction by a competent court that has some kind of guidance, if, if just minimal. And that those answers should vary from place to place. Um, but the, the bigger answer is that um, it, it's not that I'm so concerned that there are a lot of big questions out there that haven't been answered, and they might get answered by a, you know, a one person, by a panelist. It's that there's no, um, there's no consensus that there, that there should be rights there, that that's the way the policy should, policy should develop, that um, there's international consensus that any state can prohibit immoral marks if they want to, and they can do it in whatever way they want to, but there's no international consensus that there's such a thing as a universal and, you know, a, a universal immor immoral word um, that we need to ban in all forms. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I'd be pretty shocked if WIPO, you know, embarked on an exercise to figure out what those immoral words would be. And I have to be more shocked that ICAM is proposing it. Um, and, and likewise, in terms of, you know, you know what are these rec highly recognized names? What are, you know, you know, what are geographical indications divorced from use or place? Um, you know, I don't know what these things are. Um, and I, damned if I can know, so right? Yeah. Well, I, I think that when you go to, um, to uh, different geographic jurisdictions, you face uncertainty. It's like when you are in your own country, you know what are the rules that you're subject to. But when you're starting to explore abroad, it happens, like when you said, it's different rules will apply, different things will happen. So, and that generates uncertainty. And that's where, in, in, when you look at domain names, 
You know, one thing is uh, what sometimes I can generate for trademark uh, owners in the U.S. is that kind of certainty that you know the system, that you know how it works. Where when you go to a different country and you face a different culture, a different way of looking at things, it's like the Korea example today, then it, things start to get you know more uncertain and you don't know exactly what to expect. And, and I think that from um, developed countries, which um, we're, we're saying today also how important is in our GDP um, intellectual property, you know, to be able to protect that intellectual property of those trademarks outside your jurisdiction become then a high value enterprise because then your value otherwise could be undermined. No other questions? All right, thank you all. Thank you.